Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another very important episode, two in a row for Making Sense, a Eurodollar University production. My name is Emil Kalinowski. I'm joined by Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. And Jeff recently wrote a three-part series explaining why our central bank, the Federal Reserve, Jeff, does this apply to other central banks as well? Bank of Japan, European Central Bank? Unfortunately, yes. Why our central banks, all of them, mostly all of them, uh, are no longer lenders of last resort, but markets of last resort. A profound change, as Jeff explains, a profound change. And he makes a point, you know, we didn't have any congressional hearings, any parliamentary hearings. It just happened quietly. And we're going to bring it to your attention. And how we're going to do this is we're going to discuss this infographic, which is wonderful. I love it when Jeff brings out the fire and the unicorns. This is the narrative. <laughs> Hopefully not unicorns on fire though, right? <laughs> uh, let's keep that in the, our back pocket. That'll yeah. keep the audience. Will the unicorns be on fire by the end of this episode? This infographic basically is the mainstream narrative. And what we're going to do in part one, this is going to be a three part series here, part one, what is a central bank? What should a central bank be? Then part two, we're going to talk about one, two, and three that you see here in, the, um, in this graphic. And then we're going to come back to part three. We're going to finish off. We're going to talk about part four, part five, and then what really happened, which is not at all this infographic. Jeff, let us start at the beginning almost the beginning, the Federal Reserve, 1914, if I remember. Not too long after that, we had a Great Depression. And a few years later, and by few, I mean decades, it was November 2002, and Ben Bernanke, not yet the Federal Reserve Chairman, but well-known and considered an expert on the Great Depression, was giving a speech and lauding Milton Friedman and making a promise. What was happening? Yeah, it was November of 2002, then the occasion of Milton Friedman's 90th birthday. And Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz wrote A Monetary History in 1963, which essentially gave uh, economists and anybody interested in what, hap what really happened in the Great Depression, the reason for the Great Depression being what it was, which was the fact that the Federal Reserve really, 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 really screwed up. And what, what Ben Bernanke was saying, and he was a governor of the Fed at the time in November 2002. He wasn't yet a chairman, but he was... He was part of the FOMC. What he said was, you're right, Milton, we did it. We screwed up. We won't do it again. That's what he said in November of 2002 in one of those, I mean, this is more egregious than subprime is contained. It was, hey, we've studied your work. We know what happened. We understand bank crisis and what's going on. And because of that, because of your work, Milton, because of my work as Ben Bernanke, the Great Depression scholar of most, you know, most uh, most people know of when they think about the Great Depression, we will never allow something like that to happen ever again. November 8th, 2002. It would have been amazing if we could have gone to him and told him in less than five years with you at the helm, only the third worldwide depression would begin and a great monetary crisis would begin, one which would not end by the end of your term. It would still continue. I think he would be dumbstruck. If we told him a depression would happen sometime in the next century, he'd say, all right, I guess so. You never know. Less than five years away. And Jeff, you say, what do you say? You say that they did something terribly wrong. Bernanke agreed. I'm going to pull up the three graphs here, which I think show what went wrong. Well, Milton Friedman's point, and Milton and Friedman and Anna Schwartz, their their contention was that after the 1929 stock market collapse, that caused a monetary relapse, which the Federal Reserve, as a central bank, should have stepped in and provisioned enough liquidity that would have that would have interrupted that destructive monetary run before the deflationary consequences became really really truly flowered and became so destructive that they almost destroyed the economic system. And so you can see it right on the chart here, the blue, the blue bottom portion there is bank reserves. And what Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz said is, you look at 1929 to 1930, you don't see much of a change. And then in 1931, 
the level of bank reserves actually declined. And what the Federal Reserve at the time said was, well, there isn't any demand for money. Why would we supply it? Interest rates are falling. This is, you know, we, we don't need to step in. And they said, well, no, 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 you, you idiots. Don't you realize what you did? You let the monetary system relapse and then con and essentially collapse, which then led to all of the bank failures that further collapsed the entire banking system and therefore the lending and therefore the economy. So had the Fed acted toward the beginning, interrupted that, that liquidity squeeze by provisioning lots of bank reserves, then their argument was the Great Depression. It probably still would have been a pretty bad recession, but it never would have been a Great Depression. And that was the, the key error. And you can see it in the charts below if you want to scroll down a little bit. What really happened after, with, the, with no Federal Reserve as a backstop, the depository system simply collapsed because there wasn't enough, there wasn't enough liquid cash in the system. And that's what really a central bank is supposed to do in lieu of liquidity, actual money, cash and currency. Again, we're talking about currency elasticity. The Fed, the central bank is supposed to step in and act as an elasticity agent. And they didn't do that. So in the first graph that we're looking at is the Federal Reserve liabilities, cash, money. Let's call it just money broadly. Right. And if you would have looking at this chart, if you had no idea when the Great Depression began, you would have said 1934. Because between 1929 and 1933, there was little difference. I can't tell. It looks like the same level that it was in the early 1920s. There was no Great Depression there, at least according to how the Federal Reserve reacted. They didn't react until 1934. But if you look at all member bank liabilities, you see right from 1929 and all bank member bank liabilities also money for the system, for the economy. You can't miss the depression, the, the shock, the liquidity, but they missed it somehow. Okay. Yeah. So and that's the it, great error. Compared to the 20, 1920 depression, as well as the 1937, 38 depression. It's, a, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's immense. It's absolutely immense. It's incomprehensible how big of a monetary decline it was. So when we say the federal reserve screwed up, it screwed up as, as big as it was, you know, you cannot possibly have made such a, a bigger error. What about assets? Is this confirmed and this yeah, and that's, that's really the point. When when the when the liquidity system started to contract, when when depositors began to take liquid money outside of the system, when they began to claim gold and currency back from from the banking system, without that provision from the Federal Reserve, banks had no choice but to liquidate assets. Obviously, they couldn't make loans. Not only could they not make more loans, they had to liquidate what loans and securities they had available just to pay off depositors who were taking money out of the system. And again, what Friedman and Schwartz said was, if they had recourse to the Fed, if the Fed had said, we'll take those loans off your hands, we'll, we'll provide bank reserves and all sorts of other things so that you don't run afoul of regulatory, uh, reg state, like, state uh, federal regulations and things like that, that would, have, that would have at least interrupted the decline before the snowball got too big going down the hill. And would that have been the classic budget lender of last resort if that's what the Federal Reserve had done? Yeah, that's the idea. When there's a monetary shortage, what Walter Badges said in Lombard Street is, look, it doesn't matter because money is a tool. Money is a vital tool. You need to lend freely. Even if you do it at a penalty rate on good collateral, you're not actually, you're not subsidizing speculation. You're subsidizing the good parts of the system that are being overwhelmed by what they thought was, you know, emotion or depository irrationality or any you know, number of things. And even if it is, you know, uh, even if it is, you know, uh, there's rational reasons behind the deposit run or the bank run, then still the central bank's interest is limiting the damage from that before it becomes something like we saw in the 1930s. Because let's face it, there was nothing good about the 1930s. There was as much as, as bubbly as the 1920s have been, there was really no reason why the 1930s hit, should have been so awful to balance it, to have balanced it out. In fact, it didn't balance it out. It went way too far. And so Badge's doctrine was, let's limit the damage as much as possible by being an actual central bank, which means currency elasticity. Friedman and Schwartz made that point, reminded central bankers about what Badgett said, that the Federal Reserve didn't fulfill their central banking role, and Ben Bernanke made the promise that he would. But here's a twist, Jeff. You tell us that Ben Bernanke, by the time he was making that promise, and Alan Greenspan already knew that they weren't 
a central bank. So how could he make that promise? Unscramble that for us. What did he know? <laughs> yeah. And how could he make that promise then? What did he know and when did he know it, right? <laughs> Wasn't that a decade it's, earlier? Yeah, it was even more than that. I mean, look, the Federal oh, Reserve. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. I'm whew, Central Bank had said since the 1970s, this money supply stuff, we don't know. We can't figure this out. Something else is going on. And what happened was they said, well, maybe we don't need to. Maybe we don't need to know the details, the monetary details of what the banking system globally is doing. We'll just influence the behavior of banks and let them take care of all the small stuff. So we'll raise or lower the federal funds rate as we need, and that will signal to the banking system what we want them to do. And they'll take care of this elasticity or inelasticity stuff on our behalf. And up until the, the uh, 1990, late 1990s, it seemed, to, it seemed to be working really well. And the central bankers, especially Alan, uh, Ben Bernanke at that time, said, hey, we've got this nailed. <laughs> we don't need to do money. We'll just influence bank behavior, and that'll take care of it. And it was Alan Greenspan, actually, of all people, who in the late 90s kept saying, I'm worried about this. You know, we're supposed to do money. We don't do money. And, yeah, it's kind of working, and I love the fact that people think I'm a god. But, you know, deep down, I'm, I'm really worried if, if push comes to shove, we'll be able to perform like a central bank. And they had any number of discussions, as I can attest, having read through the transcripts of all of these meetings where these people were expressing doubts, especially in the wake of the Bank of Japan and quantitative easing debacle in the early part of that, that age, where they kept coming back to that same conclusion. If push comes to shove... Will we really be able to influence bank behavior so that we can establish a, a, an elasticity regime during the worst types of crisis? So when Ben Bernanke told Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz in November 2002, we won't do it again, he was in one sense lying to them. He didn't know they wouldn't be able to do it again. He was assuming that everything would continue to behave the way it had up until that point, even though everything in the monetary system had changed by then, long before that. And that was really the arrogance he displayed and it continued to display. Subprime is contained. You know, all the other stuff that went on afterwards, even though no matter what the Federal Reserve did, the problem, the monetary problem, the elasticity problem was inside the banking system, which the Fed could not manage because all it ever did from this, really the 50s forward was influence behavior, not actually do. It was not actually a central bank. Thank you. This new doctrine incorporates the fact the Federal Reserve actually is not a central bank. What it may be, however, and the jury's still out, a marginal asset buyer, the market of last resort. QE and the, QE and the like focus instead on bailing out markets impaired by the eruption of gross currency inelasticity for reasons left unexplored. Jeff, in part two, we're going to delve into some examples, really good detailed examples that reference that infographic I brought up in the beginning. And then in part three, we're going to close the loop and show what really happened as well as what the media narrative is regarding March 2020.